Dana Williamson, conservator here at the Peterson Automotive Museum, and uh, today on this episode of Driving with Dana, we have a really classic American sports car called the DuPont. This is a 1929 DuPont Model G Speedster. Now, just by saying DuPont, uh, what brings to mind for everybody is chemicals, the DuPont chemical family. Well, this is actually that that family, uh, E. DuPont, uh, E. Paul DuPont, decided that he wanted to go into the car business. So in 1928, they started building the DuPont automobile. They manufactured cars from 1928 to 1932. Uh, so we're taking out this 29 DuPont Model G Speedster for a little spin. Um, I have to tell you that uh, this is a non-synchro gearbox. So uh, there are no synchros, the shifting, as you'll notice, might be a, a little loud now and then. Now they built about uh, nine uh, Model G Speedsters, and this is one of probably only three that have survived, so they say. Uh, it's, a, it's a big car, uh, it's about, it has a wheelbase of about 122 inches, it's got a little over 100 horsepower, it's a straight eight. This car was actually, these cars were built in Maryland. Uh, and uh, the DuPont Motor Company was in Maryland. Like I said, E. Paul DuPont owned the company. And uh, bear with me a second here. And then this particular Speedster was shipped to Los Angeles uh, to a DuPont dealer, the only DuPont dealer out here in, in California, on the corner of Wilshire, which we're on, we're traveling Wilshire Boulevard right now, on the corner of Wilshire and Oxford. Now, it's called the Speedster because actually, like I said, this is an American sports car. It was also used for racing. Uh, a Model G Speedster raced at Le Mans in 1929 and did the Indy 500 in 1930. Now by looking at it, uh, like I said, it's a very big stately car. And uh, you'd say, wow, this raced Le Mans and it raced uh, Indy 500, it has fenders on it. You know, how did it do that? Well, what they would do is they would remove the fenders and this, the Model G Speedster actually averaged almost 90 miles an hour at Le Mans and the same thing at the Indy 500. Unfortunately, due to gearbox problems, um, it, never, it never finished, never finished either race. But you know what's interesting? The Model G Speedster, they made it in a couple of different configurations. Uh, actually, I think three different configurations. The Model G Speedster that went to Le Mans was actually a four-seater car. Because if you had a car and you wanted to enter it in Le Mans, and it was over 1,100 cc's, it had to be four passenger. So you would have to drive a four passenger car, and that's what raced Le Mans. And if you only had one passenger riding with you, you had to put sandbags in the rear seat to fill, uh, uh, to make up the weight for the two passengers that were not there. So it was, and also if you were in a convertible, like the Speedster's configuration that I'm driving, you would also have to drive with the top up for a certain number of hours, and then you could drive with the top down. So there were quite a few regulations back in, uh, in 1929. Also in 1929, I think there was a field of about 40 cars in Le Mans, and there were nine American cars in that field of 40, which is pretty cool. Of course, a lot of the well-known, you know, Stutz was, uh, they had, had several cars, uh, factory Stutzes that would race. So it was actually, uh, it was a pretty good showing for, for American automobiles. Um, the DuPont, uh, this being the Model G, like I said, was, uh, was the Speedster, was the racing version. They also made the sedan versions and the Phaeton versions, and these cars, were, I would say they would be on the luxury end of the cars in the late 20s and early 30s. And they were actually sold to many, many 
Hollywood celebrities. Uh, Mary Pickford, uh, she, uh, the uh, star of silent films, bought one for her then husband, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. A lot of uh, directors and producers and actors were all wanting, wanting the DuPont. Uh, like I said, uh, it makes a, a, great, uh, a great presence. Uh, like I said, very stately, very classic. Uh, and driving it now, it hand, this is a car that I would take anywhere. I, I've been able to do a couple of rallies in this car. I did one in Santa Fe, up and down the hills and valleys of Santa Fe. It performed marvelously. Um, it's, uh, it's very roadable, very streetable. And like I said, you take off the fenders, you hit the racetrack, averaging 80 to 90 miles an hour is, is not too shabby. Of course, like I said, uh, this, this car has probably um, a little over 100 horsepower. I think the brochure advertised that it's close to 140 horsepower. I don't think that's the case. Uh, it also said that it had a top speed of close to 120 miles an hour. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think this car has ever uh, uh, probably made it over uh, 100 miles an hour, maybe. You know, like I said, averaging 80 and 90, it probably had some faster spurts on the racetrack, but I don't believe this car ever saw 120 miles an hour or any of the, of the others that were built. So like I said, the DuPont Motor Car Company was in business from 1928 to 32, and it actually went out of business uh, in 1932. All the dealerships were closed, and uh, all the cars were, were auctioned off. Now, Another feature of the car, uh, this particular, like I said, in its, in its uh, sports car road going uh, capacity, it has a, uh, a hood ornament, uh, like a radiator mascot, which is a Leak Crystal Eagle. Uh, fairly rare, uh, not the rarest of the Leak Crystal uh, ornaments, but um, maybe the most common, but still, still very valuable. It was a it was an option back in the in the twenties that you could get to uh, to uh, as an accessory for your car. Now, if you notice, the exhaust note is a fairly fairly loud note because the car was equipped with an exhaust cutout. The exhaust cutout was you could pull the lever down here by my foot, and it would dump the exhaust right out of the engine. Uh, without going through a muffler, therefore giving you several more horsepower as as you would want, you know, having a sports or a sports car, or uh, hence the name Speedster, of course. This Speedster uh, they made in uh, uh, a configuration of a um, like a boat tail, which is this one, which is pointed in the back, or they also made one that had a flat. Uh, the, the rear dropped off fairly flat, had a spare tire mounted, and a couple of those also had a rumble seat. Open it up a little bit here. Of course, your problem isn't going fast. Your problem is if you have to stop in hurry. Uh, mechanical brakes, a lot of foot pressure here. Very nice, very nice. You know, it just kind of makes you wish that it wasn't. We weren't in LA traffic, and we could go somewhere and uh, and uh, really put it put it through its through its paces. There you go. You hear that non-synchro. Get the RPMs down here into first gear. Here we go. Uh, so yes, the configure, they also made a configuration that had a flat spare tire on the back and had a rumble seat. And like I said, of the nine that were built, only three survived. And this is one of those three. Take a few minutes here and just listen to that exhaust though. A big whopping eight cylinder engine just clanking away. You know, um, like cars of this era, it's not a car that you can just uh, 
drive with one hand on the wheel and the other hand on the back of the seat. It takes both feet, and both hands, to operate. So I think, you know, not only driving a car that is only one of three, and a DuPont, very rare, but also a car that had great Los Angeles history. You know, that it was sold right here in Los Angeles, right here on Wilshire Boulevard, not too, you know, not too far from where their museum is. For those of you who don't know where we are, we're on the corner of Wilshire and Fairfax. And these are the kind of cars that you can see when you come to the museum. The car, every car we have there at the museum has a story. Uh, they're all interesting stories. Many of them all have ties to um, Los Angeles and the California car culture. That's what we try to do, try to educate uh, people when they come to the museum on, um, uh, on the automobile, not just as a mode of transportation, but how the automobile uh, culture changed people's lives, you know? And uh, the design of automobiles uh, as pieces of art, they could be displayed. They could be heralded for their engineering and found. So as we head back to the museum, um, I hope you viewers are, uh, are enjoying uh, interesting cars that we take out once in a while and also that uh, you come down to the museum you come down and see all the different cars that we have we have a new vault exhibit I'm sure everyone's heard about the vault here at the Peterson Museum but we've now opened up the vault it's twice the size we have an international tour where we have we have over 200 automobiles uh, French automobiles German English American uh, you know they uh, Italian. Here we are, we're turning off of uh, Wilshire Boulevard down Fairfax. We're going to be heading into the museum. So uh, hopefully you people could hear me. I'm a little hoarse right now, uh, trying to uh, speak over the exhaust note. As we pull into the pull off of Fairfax uh, into the museum, ready to put this back down in the vault where you can view it uh, anytime you come in and take a vault tour. Uh, I want to thank you for for watching, and uh, hopefully you'll tune into the next driving with Dana, where we'll drive something even more interesting. I shouldn't say more interesting; I should say just as interesting. So please drive with passion, but drive safely.